Hi, I'm Mott Suman and welcome to Jerry's Live. Today's class code is JL286 and our class today is all about creating glitch art. If you don't know what glitch art is, I'm going to get into that in just a second. But like I said, today's class code is JL286. So if you see anything, any of the products that we're using today and you like them, you want to get them, go to jerrysartorama.com and type in our search bar just that class code JL286 and it'll bring up our teacher's cart where you can find all of this stuff. And yeah, <laughs> so if I didn't, I think I said my name. <laughs> Sorry, I was really hyper right before we started this. So I'm like getting a little bit of energy out, but like I probably said before, my name is Mott Tuman. I am your host. And let's talk about what glitch art is. So glitch art is something that kind of a trend that's been occurring for a few years now, but it's essentially adding techniques that you would traditionally see in digital art and photography into traditional art like we see right here. So things like color distortion. This specifically is a color distortion called chromatic aberration, which is a big fancy word for essentially your camera lens is distorting just a little bit where you're getting these different colorways being pulled in different directions and you get a really cool effect like this. And I'm going to be showing you guys how to create that today using oil paints, specifically with glazing over a black and white image like this. If you've already painted out your black and white image and you want to create that chromatic aberration effect. So before we get into oil painting, I'm going to go over a little bit how you can create this effect if you don't have a reference. I'm going to be using a reference and I'm going to tell you too how you can get a reference photo. This is one that I digitally edited myself. Uh, I believe we have the original reference photo of this. If you want to digitally edit your own photo to be able to use a reference for these, I'm not going to explain how you can digitally edit your own like this. There are plenty of tutorials out there. It is, it looks very, very complicated. Whoops. <laughs> it looks very complicated, but I promise it's much simpler than it seems. So if we can go to the overhead. I have this useful little color chart here. This is what we're going to start out talking with is just how essentially our colors are working here. So the reference that I'm using today is a black and white image that I then pulled the colorways out of essentially. So I turned my reference image that you guys are going to get into black and white before I did this chromatic aberration effect. You can do this effect on a colored image, but for simplicity, I wanted to stick to black and white so we don't get too muddied up with all the crazy colors. But just so you guys know, you can do this with a colored image. but Right here, you might notice I spelled subtractive wrong. It's supposed to say subtractive. I wrote it in Sharpie, it was too late. But there's essentially two different ways that you can mix colors. One that is typically used for light, called your additive color mixing, and one that's typically used for like paint traditionally, which is subtractive color mixing. Now, I painted this up really quick so we got these wonderful wonky circles, but you can use either of these if you wanna achieve your chromatic aberration effect. It just really depends on what color you want your background to be. So if you want your background color to be a black, you would use the additive color chart. And if you want it to be white, you'd use the subtractive color chart. Now, the main difference here is that they are essentially just flip-flopped, right? So I have like my red, my blue, and my green right here, and they mix together into a magenta, cyan, yellow, and then all of them together, white, right? And then it's kind of the opposite for your subtractive colors. It's a cyan, magenta, and yellow, and then they mix to a blue, green, red, and then black. So just think about, this is a useful chart that you can have on the side of your painting. If you're doing this without a reference, which is difficult, but it's not too bad if you have something like this that you can kind of use as a cheat sheet. I really recommend creating your own color chart. And it's really helpful. These, I should specify, these are acrylics here. They are not the colors that we are gonna be using today. This is just a nice, helpful diagram for you guys. But if you figure out what colors you want to use for your chromatic aberration effect, um, you can create this color chart to kind of see if the effect works or not. Like the colors in, that are in here, I'm not entirely happy with. So I probably wouldn't have used these colors. I probably would have switched them up a little bit. But you get the idea of like, it's a red, it's a blue, it's a green, right? And while I wish I could tell you like, here's the specific color codes that you can use to get this perfect effect. I unfortunately, it's a little more complicated than that, right? So I have, I'll show you the paints that I use today. You're gonna need six paints, essentially six different colors. I actually used one more than that, but I'll get to that in a second. 
We're using our Charvin fine oil paints today. These are great paints and you're going to need essentially three different pairs, right? You got a cyan and a blue, your blue, your green and your yellow, and then your red and your magenta. Now, instead of magenta, I chose an intense pink for this because I wanted to use a lot of the the Charvin brand has a lot of intense colors, an intense line of colors, which is kind of like fluorescence. They aren't fluorescence, but they're really bright. And oftentimes when you're doing like this chromatic effect, chromatic aberration effect with light, you want some really intense colors, which is why I chose these. So instead of magenta, I decided to go with this intense peak just to make it really pop. And then I also have, instead of a cyan here, I have their intense viridian. And I found like these colors seem to work best for what I wanted. When you're looking for the colors that you want to use for this, you might not be able to find something that's specifically labeled like cyan that's going to work perfectly, right? Your cyan might not be like intense enough depending on what brand you're choosing. So you might want to experiment a little bit with like slightly different colors. They're still going to give you the same effect, but you're going to have slightly different colors that are going to work well for this, right? Okay, so I have already some of these poured out to the side and I should say too, Oops. <laughs> I have a lot of paint tubes right here. I also had, I also used this intense blue. Because even though I had my designated cyan and my designated blue, when you're doing a realistic image like this where you have a lot of complex colors going on, this isn't something that's like blocks of colors. Uh, I wanted something that I could use for a gradient. So I chose this intense blue specifically so I could have a little bit of a gradient coming out of this cyan phthalo. Because you can see here in my reference image, there's a lot of like really cool blue tones that are like very subtly hinted at here that I thought the cyan phthalo would be a little too dark. So that is why I have that blue. Feel free to pick out colors that you can use to create gradients, especially if you're gonna be using that color a lot like I did. But yeah, that is how you can get, well, I don't have to, I want to come back to this here because I just remembered I forgot something. But I want to say whenever you're creating this effect and you want to not use a reference, uh, essentially what we have here is that every spot you have essentially just three circles, as you can see in our color chart here. Or like if you want to create your own image, what you're essentially going to be doing is taking whatever you want to draw and overlapping it three times in slightly different places. Like you can use this with tracing paper, you can do this with a light, and then what you're going to be doing is wherever you have if you're doing subtractive colors, wherever you have a cyan and a yellow, you're going to be painting overlapping. You're going to be painting green. Wherever you have a magenta and a yellow, you're going to be painting red. And then whenever you have like a cyan and a magenta, you're going to be painting blue in those overlapping areas. That's kind of the science under how, how you can get this. <clears throat> how you can get this. Excuse me. So I have my reference image here. I'm going to slide that away. And then I'm going to get out this black and white painting that I did. In order to get this, all I did essentially is I took this photo, I created the chromatic aberration effect, and then I turned it into black and white so that I could paint it out as just a grisaille oil painting, right? So you can see here where I'm going to layer in colors in this area. It kind of already starts to look like it's glitching a little bit. And then I'm just, all I'm going to do is glaze those colors on top with my oils. Now, we're going to get, start painting here. I just realized I forgot to grab something for you guys that I thought would be a helpful example. Because I did try, the reason I'm doing this in oils, you can do this effect in any kind of medium, really. The reason I decided to do this in oils is that I actually tried doing it in acrylics before this. But the thing about acrylics is that you can't glaze colors like you can in watercolors or oils, right? And glazing colors simplifies this a lot. Because if I have all these colors and I immediately try to start painting this, it can be very frustrating very quickly. So. On the side here, I have my nice palette with my colors already put out. And I'm just going to show you how to glaze. I'm going to start on this edge here, start glazing, glazing the side of that. So I have some lavender brush of the Chelsea Classical Studio, some lavender brush cleaner in a little container here. And then all this is is a little bit of linseed oil that I'm going to be using. And I'm going to be using it with some Creative Mark Black Swan synthetic brushes for our oil paint. And then to glaze color, we do have a whole show on how you can glaze using oil paints that Emmy did previously. I highly recommend you check that out. But all you have to do to glaze colors is you're going to take the tiniest bit of your oil paint here. 
And you're gonna mix it in with a good amount of linseed oil. So you essentially get a nice transparent color here. And then all I'm gonna do is start very carefully painting over where I want the red to go. You can see I have this color pretty transparent right now. I oiled it down quite a bit, but you can add a little bit more pigment if you want. And these pigments, they're gonna get, they're not gonna be quite, I mean, the wonderful thing about glazing is that your colors, you don't have to, you know, mix them with white or black, which would lower the intensity. And for creating a chromatic aberration effect, you want your colors to be super intense, right? So my red that I'm putting in here isn't quite as intense as I want, so I might in a second add in a little bit more of this red into our oil here. And if you guys kind of want to know, the science behind glazing is that whenever you're doing oil painting, you want to do what is essentially called fat over lean, where you're building up your fat layers the higher you go, which is why I can mix my oil paint in here with a lot of linseed oil, and it's going to create that nice glaze and it's gonna follow the rule of fat over lean, even though it's a really thin layer. It has a really high fat content. And any layer that I wanna put over this is gonna also need to be high in fat. Do we have any questions while I'm starting to put this first color down here? Hmm? Not yet. Hopefully I've explained it well then. <laughs> okay, so I'm putting my red down. The wonderful thing here that you can see from my reference image is that you can actually kind of, it's a lot of confusing colors, but you can kind of see where we have, especially like right here at the top of the fins, and then up here too, you can see where we have our blue shape, our green shape, and our red shape. And then they're all overlapping together to create the rest of these really complex colors. So I find starting out at the edge with your main colors of red, green, and blue is going to be really helpful for keeping this like not too complicated. And then I'm going to put a little bit of red down here. You can kind of see in my reference image where um, that red breaks a little bit right there and you have other colors peeking through. So I think I'm actually just going to leave it out for now until I put those other colors in. And then you can start picking out other areas here where your reds are present, like at the top of my fin right there. And this glaze that I've created goes a really long way, right? You only need the tiniest bit of paint. I probably poured out way too much oil paint here because you really only need the smallest amount, especially since you're gonna be mixing it with a lot of oil. You know, don't be afraid to use your supplies, but also don't waste them if you don't have to. And if you have any colors here that you end up not using, you pour out too much paint, it's really easy just to take your paint and put it in like a airtight sealed container of some sort, like a little box, and that's gonna keep it from drying out if you don't end up using it. I have this little fin down here that I'm gonna be glazing that red over top of as well. Probably use a little bit of a smaller brush for this, so I'm gonna get my rag out. These tiny little details on the end of my fin. I'm just gonna brush that off and set it to the side. I'll have to remember if I want to use that for a different color that I need to wash it off in my brush cleaner. And I don't you you guys got quite a bit of glare, but you can kind of see that red is starting to take shape on the edge of that. Yes. Um Carol is wondering if you could like explain a little more of the fat and lean concept. Okay, so I'm gonna preface this by saying I did a lot of research on this, but I am actually still pretty new to oil painting. Emmy actually taught me it recently, and I've been having a lot of fun with this, but I'm gonna say my idea of what fat over lean is, is that essentially you have your solvents, right? Typically when you're starting an oil painting, you're starting out with uh, mixing your paint with solvents to thin it down and then doing like an underpainting, okay? That solvent, 
is making your paint less fatty. So that's kind of like, that's what it means by lean, right? You have a less fatty layer. And then as you go on adding more layers of oil paint, this does not apply if you're doing what's called an alla prima painting, where you're essentially painting everything at once. You know, you're doing one sitting with oil painting, you're not gonna come back to it later after like it's become touch dry or anything. Um, but if you plan to keep coming back and adding more layers of it, this is where the fat really, rule really applies. So you have your first thin layer of like um, your solvent mixed with your paint. And then whatever you put on top of that, you have to have more fats in. So if you put a straight layer of just oil paint on top of that straight out of the tube, that's going to be fattier than mixed with solvent, right? But if you put another layer over top of that, you might want to do something like when you're glazing, where you have even higher oil content because you're mixing in a linseed oil into that. That's essentially what the fat over lean is, right? You wouldn't want to go back over your straight tubes of paint with like a thin solvent. To, otherwise, you're going to risk in the future losing your archivability and getting cracking and your paint not sticking properly or adhering properly to your surface. So that essentially is what your fat over lean concept means. Did you do the grisaille and oil as well? And how long would you say that it took to get to where you could paint over it confidently? Um, so, sorry, can you repeat that first question again? <laughs> um, the black and white painting. Yes. Is that also an oil? Yes, it is also an oil. And then Nola's wondering how long it took to dry, but I'm not, it's not all the way dry yet, right? No. So oil paints take an incredibly long time to dry. Typically, if you're not mixing any kind of solvent in, because solvent or fast drying medium is going to make your paint dry faster, it'll take approximately six months for your paints to dry fully. Now that really depends on what environment you're in. If you're in a really humid environment, they're going to dry slower. Um, but six months is generally the time that people used to say, like, your oil paints are probably good to varnish, right? You should not varnish prior to that point because you might risk uh, essentially upsetting the layers that are still drying. But um, if you want to paint more layers on top and you don't want to work what is essentially like a wet on wet, because if you are painting, right, and you save your oil paints and you're going to paint again the exact next day, you're technically still painting a wet on wet because your oil paints aren't touch dry yet. But once your oil paints are touch dry, that is essentially when you can start a new layer of oil painting. So that's in general like how drying works with an oil paints. It, like people, don't be afraid of using oil paints because of how long they can dry because you can always use solvents in fast drying mediums. But just be, when people say like six months for them to fully dry, they don't mean like they're gonna be like sopping wet for the next six months, right? It just means like the paint underneath your outer layer since it dries by oxidation. Um, and oxidation is essentially drying by, you know, oxygen. The paint, it dries, uh, excuse me, it dries from the outside in. So your outer layer is going to dry before the paint underneath it is. So that's why it'll be touch dry long before the whole painting will be completely dry. Yeah. And did you say that this could be done with watercolors as well if you wanted to, or? Yeah. So you can do this kind of effect with a lot of mediums. I'm doing this specifically with glazing. Uh, and glazing is a technique that works for more transparent colors like watercolor and oils. It would not work well with acrylics. Um, but the technique that I described at the beginning of this class, where you're looking at your different shapes or you're tracing an image three times, like it overlaps slightly in three different ways, can be accomplished with acrylics. I see a lot of people, if you look up chromatic aberration on like YouTube, lots of people will do it with, like things like paint markers. Um, they'll go over it essentially draw it out, separate what their different areas are, and essentially do it just like I did this color chart, where it's like I have different designated sections for each color, and I'm going to paint each section in with that specific color. And that's how you can get this to work with acrylics. Glazing like this would not work well with acrylics. But yeah, it is something that you can accomplish with watercolors if you want to do a grisaille painting and then do a really thin wash of different colors over top of it. Keep in mind, though, that watercolors aren't going to be quite as intense as your oil colors are going to be when you're doing this. Um, glazing works wonderfully with oil, with watercolors, but sometimes you're not able to get quite the level of opacity 
with watercolors that you can with oils, which is part of the reason why I chose this over watercolors, even though I love watercolors. <laughs> As Emmy knows, every time we're talking about ideas, she's like, um, you can't think of it like watercolors. It's something different. <laughs> I'm sorry, I love watercolors. Okay. So we're starting to get a little bit of my reds in here. But for time's sake, I'm just going to do the very edge of this tail. And then I'm going to switch to a different color. Even though there's a lot more red in this image. Actually, I'm going to do the eye and then I'm going to switch to another color. Because the eye, this eye right here is probably the best part. Just because of how, like, the amount of overlapping that's going on right there is so cool. So I'm going to do an area of the eye and then I'm going to switch colors so you guys can start seeing the effect kind of coming together. Okay. Now I'm wiping my brush occasionally on this rag that I have up here. Um, that's only because I get like a little too much oil on my brush and not enough pigment. So I'm just wiping it off so I can get the right amount of pigment that I want. And the only way that you can know how much oil don't, for how much pigment when it's on your brush is really just practicing. You're going to get a feel for how well that color lays down if there's too much oil in it or how opaque it's going to be. And that's how you're going to be able to tell. So this eye has a lot of really tiny details in it. And it was a lot of fun to paint on this one. I mean, you guys can see how crazy it got when I was doing this. I'm going to hold that up a little bit because I spent a long time on it. So I want you guys to see the details. But I'm just going to keep following my reference image here. I got this red color kind of shifted. Something to know about chromatic aberration is that the effect kind of works where your colors, like all of your red colors are going to be like on the right, righter side of the image. I shouldn't say the right side because obviously we have colors in the image here, but like on my eye here, you can see I have red just right there in the eye and then kind of all shifted towards this edge of the fish, right? They're all being shifted towards this edge. Whereas my blue colors are all shifted in this direction. Because that's essentially when I did my Photoshop image. I just took the layers of different colors and I went doop, and then I went doop, and the other way. And it's the same thing if you want to do this with like paint markers or something. You're just going to essentially take your colors of the image and just slightly not overlap them. The opposite of whatever overlapping is. Unoverlap them. Put a little bit more red there. Something to know too. When I did this painting here, I have some thicker layers of tube paints in these areas that have less, um, essentially I took less oil content. I took the paint straight out, whoops. I took the paint straight out of the tube before I put it on this painting. That's something you don't wanna do if you're working over multiple days and you've already got your glaze down, always make sure your paint has like fatter layers in it. But if you're working within the same day, if I laid these glazes down and then I took some paint here that is almost straight out of the tube and then laid it on top of my red there, that's okay to do because it's still kind of mixing with those oils that are already there and I don't have to worry about as much of it not adhering properly. So you can see here like my paint's sticking down pretty well. But if you're painting over multiple days, do not take paint straight from the tube and put it over your glaze because things can get a little bit tricky once it's been touch dried. Like over time, this could start breaking apart essentially. Not breaking apart, but you know, the archivability isn't gonna be as good. And I'm gonna do that a little bit more with my eye. Since I want those colors to be super intense. Okay, so I got a little bit of my reds thrown down in there. And I am going to now clean off my brush. A little bit of paint on the table but it's blocked so you guys can't see it. I'm gonna clean off my brush here just swishing it around in my brush cleaner. I'm keeping this brush cleaner um, capped when I'm working just because this is the Chelsea Classical, Chelsea Classical uh, lavender brush cleaner and this brush cleaner is solvent free it's non-toxic I believe and so like the fumes from it aren't super intense or anything but I'm gonna, you can still like smell it. It's a pretty strong smell. So anyone with smell sensitivities here, I'm gonna keep that covered just so that we don't have to be breathing it in, but it's not gonna cause you any issues if you have it open. It's actually a pretty nice smell because it smells like lavender. <laughs> so I'm gonna start, 
I think with one of my blues over here, after I start with my blue, actually, tell me what colors you guys wanna see me throw in here, cause I'm gonna have a limited amount of time to choose. Um, so what I'm gonna try to get as many as I can, but if you want any colors in particular that you wanna see me place in, let me know. So I'm gonna start with my cyan, which I used the Intense Viridian for. If you guys can see it right there. So I'm gonna start on the very edge right here with that Intense Viridian. And I'm just gonna throw down a lot more oil than that. And create my glaze. And I should switch brushes too, and remember to clean the one I was using previously, since it still has red in it. So I'm just gonna swish it around. I'm gonna dab that off on my cloth. Please note, if you don't um, dab your brush off after you swished it around in your brush cleaner, it's gonna act very similarly to a solvent. So it's gonna be thinning those paint down so keep that in mind, because that can disrupt your painting layers, the whole fat over lean. So make sure you dab off whatever brush cleaner is still in your brush on a rag before you go back to mixing your colors. So I have that intense Viridian glaze right there. And I'm going to start just laying it in on this line right here. Something to keep in mind too, a few of the brushes, I have a couple more brushes here that I used on this painting. The Pro Stroke and the Professional Control Almond Filbert. These are wonderful brushes for oil painting. Um, something to keep in mind is that they are long handled. I originally did this painting on an easel, um, but now we are painting flat. When you're painting on an easel versus painting flat, you something that might be helpful is the length of your brush handle. So when you're painting on an easel, it's a lot more helpful to have a brush with a long handle as opposed to one with a short handle like I have right here, right? So when you're painting flat, it's a lot easier if you don't have that whole long handle sticking out, which is why I got our wonderful Black Swan Creative Mark brushes, which I love very much. And I've been using them a lot to practice all the oil painting I've been doing. Also, if you guys got any oil painting tips, I need all the tips I can get because <laughs> Obviously I want to be an expert on this. I want to be able to teach you guys the best I can. So if you have any got like any niche or cool oil painting tips, please feel free to share them in the chat because I'd love to read through them. So I'm going to start putting down. I have like the edge of my fins right here. I have that really crazy effect going on. And I'm going to start just putting a little bit of that in. Going through, trying to get the curve of all those fins. I will say if you're going to do an oil painting glaze like this with a really complicated image like this goldfish, be prepared for a long time painting, right? And a lot of like brain scratching over like what is happening with these colors because it took me forever to figure out what was going on in this area of the fish's face because there's just so much layers of color that are really close to each other and they're all really kind of getting dark and desaturated in that area. So be prepared. <laughs> But the payoff is worth it. The payoff is so worth it to get this wonderful effect. Glitch art is something that's really been exciting me lately. I've seen a lot of people adding like pixels into their art as well. And I would love to try that out if you guys want to show on how to do pixel art. That's kind of like a part two to glitch art. Also let me know that. Um, cause I would, I mean, it's not too complicated of a technique to do, but it's a lot of fun and it adds a lot of interest to a painting, especially if you have, I've seen some people who have had super realistic paintings with just like certain details were pixelized. It's just really neat. Christina and I are over here just nodding our heads. Like yeah. <laughs> I saw a comment on Facebook and now I've lost it, but I'm pretty sure they were asking if you could do your underpainting in acrylic and then glaze over it in oils. Yes, I believe you can do that. Um, as long as you're not putting acrylic on top of oils, I think it works well. Um, but just, you can do your underpainting in acrylics and it works totally fine. I'm sorry, I keep moving. I talk with my hands, so I keep moving my hands over the dyna dynamic camera here. <laughs> so I'll learn. I just have to be conscious of it. <laughs> so I'm gonna put, I have 
You can see here, I have these super dark layers of blue that I've painted in as like a pure black on the side of this. Yes. Uh, I have Mary on YouTube asking, uh, does the fish have a name? Cause he is, or they are super cute. I don't know if it's girl fish or boy fish. I don't know. I I don't know how to tell um, the gender of the fish. What was what was the Ferdinand? Ferdinand. I, I like that. Even if it's a girl, her name is Ferdinand. Yes. Oh, Ferdinand. I'll go with Ferdinand. I love that name. <laughs> Ferdinand the fish. <laughs> I'm gonna just start emphasizing. There's a lot going on in this area of my fin right here. There's a lot going on and you can even see like this painting that I have showed you guys is actually not complete. I left some areas of it like the tail unfinished. But you can see right here in the fin, I almost kind of ignored my reference a little bit just because there was so much going on. I knew I could still kind of get away with the effect if I just start brushing some of the colors that I saw and lines in that area of the fin. So if you're using a complicated reference like this, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to stick to every single detail of exactly what it is. You can still get the same effect if you're a little bit loose, as long as you get these main lines of colors on it, right? And I'm realizing now that this looks a little bit like the TikTok logo, which I think has the same chromatic aberration effect. We have some very similar colors going right there. But you can see too, I have a lot of different colors going in my image, but you can still achieve the effect with just two different colors. If you're choosing like, you know, I could do it with my magenta and my cyan, like in the TikTok logo, if I just have those two color ways that are split off. Now I have all three, but you can still accomplish it with even just two colors instead of going for all different, uh, I say three colors, but I, really I mean like cyan, magenta, yellow, or red, green, uh, blue, if you're doing this. But you can still kind of get the same effect. And if anyone's wondering, I don't think anyone has asked this, but several people here have asked me if this works with 3D glasses. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't been able to get... That was a question! <laughs> yeah, I haven't been able to get 3D glasses to try. I will say when I was a little kid, my brother and I used to draw like overlapping images with like different, like a blue and a red colored pencil all the time like this. And we would put on our 3D glasses and be like, whoa, it's working. But half the time I was lying because it wasn't really working that well. <laughs> I would just be like, yeah, yeah, it's, it looks really cool. Thanks. <laughs> also, I want to shout out, speaking of my brother, my family, I want to shout out right now to my grandmother, whose birthday it is tomorrow. She's watching tonight. Uh, she played a really huge role in getting me involved in art as a child. So happy birthday, grandma. I love you very much. <laughs> I hope you're having a good time. Yeah, Ginger asked earlier what it would look like through 3D glasses, and I just said, insane. Yeah. <laughs> if I find 3D glasses, I will let you guys know. There's so many things that I need to put Where into... Are you Googling how to make them? Yeah. <laughs> what? There's a lot of stuff that I need to put into our Facebook Live group chat right now, including the impasto painting I did last week, which I'm still working on getting those edges out. <laughs> did you get... Oh my gosh, wait. I can't... Wait, look... <laughs> Okay, so Christina's standing off to the side here with um, gels. gels, a red and a blue gel, to see if it, she can Do see it. One, one Looking truly unhinged. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry you guys can't see this right now. I'll show you in a second what the gels it look like. It works. Yeah? A little bit. It's a little blurry, but it's sort of popping off. Oh, no, wait. I have to see this now, please. Okay, so these are the gels that she was looking through, right? And she just put one eye up to each one, which already makes things look absolutely insane. Oh my gosh! No, it does! Okay, it's a yes. It's a yes to the 3D glasses. Oh my gosh, that is so cool. Okay, I'm gonna get myself a pair of 3D glasses now. That was really cool looking. Thank you! It's very trippy. Okay, what was I doing? Yes, it works with 3D glasses. That looks so cool. Oh my gosh. I'm like, I did that. Uh, so yes, this effect pays off. You can wow all your friends just showing them, breeding 3D glasses to see your art, right? I can totally imagine someone having like an art show and putting 3D glasses there for everyone to just to look at the stuff. It was so much fun. Okay, I'm putting a little bit of cyan. I have, I'm looking at my old painting as a reference now. I should be looking at my reference image. I have in this eye right here, you can see kind of three different circles happening your green, your red, and your blue right there, right? And I'm working 
on the edge of this blue circle there's like a little hint of cyan right there that's what I'm trying to paint in right now so I'm trying to make sure it all looks kind of circular and that's kind of the trick with this type of chromatic aberration painting is just breaking it down into the large shapes of what's happening right simplifying this eye down in just a circle it's just a circle and it's moved a little bit off to the side of one another just like our little color chart there and just adding in that color and there's even a little bit of a hint right above the eye which I'm just gonna hint at just the tiniest bit right okay did we get a consensus of what colors we wanted to add to this after we do our cyan here? Any opinion? I think the only one I didn't get a vote for was pink. Yeah? <laughs> okay, so no pink. How about we do, let's do the yellow, because I might just do the green in junction with the yellow, because there's a lot of overlap between greens and yellows in this picture, and I will say I think yellow is our next most prominent color here. So I'm just going to hint a little more of our cyan. Do a touch of it right up here, too. Okay. Now I think I'm going to wash off my brush, and I'm going to start putting our yellow in. That's looking really crazy. I will say I'm a little sad that I got this on camera, and I'm like, the eyes are just, they feel off to me. That's something I'll have to... I probably won't redo this painting because I've already done it twice <laughs> and it's a long painting to do but like I just want to go rip, rip. if this was a digital painting like a lot of people do with chromatic aberration I would totally just go rip, on that eye okay we're starting our yellow here putting my linseed oil down getting that yellow mixed in I'm gonna be very careful since I have this wet red glaze already down here to try and not touch it there are some areas where they're kind of mixing, so I get some very orangey areas in here. So I might use them to mix an oil, I mean an orange, they already are oils, to add a little hint of that. But for the most part, I'm going to try to keep them fairly separated so we still get that like effect of different lines of color. So I'm going to add a little more pigment into that. Now I'm going to start putting my yellow down. You can actually see in my painting here, you can't see um, the split between where the yellow ends and like this other like white mixture begins. I'm gonna hold it up so you guys can see that a little bit better. You can see it on our colored image, but in my reference photo when it was black and white, you could not see that divide. So I don't have a clear difference in values here of where the colors change because yellow is a very light value and it's gonna look very similar to your whites when you put it in black and white. So I have to be careful when I'm going through this to be conscious of where my yellow ends and like my whites begin. So I'm gonna go down on this eye. You can even see here, I have a lot of reddish tones right in the pupil of this eye. I'm gonna go back and try to put that in because it's mixing with the yellow. So I'm gonna paint over that eye with the yellow anyway. And come down, it kind of ends right there. And that's where the cyan tone kind of picks up a little bit more. And then there's another hint of it right down here. Okay. There's a lot of just very careful pulling lines down, right? I have, I managed to get a paintbrush here that was almost the exact width of the line that I wanted. I recommend you try doing that. Oh, see, I picked up that red right there. But that's okay, because I actually think that area is a little bit orangey. So I'm just kind of trying to work it in a little bit, maybe push it back. That's the wonderful thing about oils too, is that they're super workable. Like I could go back right now and if I wasn't happy with these glazes, I could take my rag and like wipe them off a little bit and go over them again. So actually I'm gonna show you guys. I can go back on top here. I can just wipe that yellow away if I'm not totally happy with it. So if you lay down a color and then you're like, actually I don't really like what that color looks like, just pick it back up. to drag this yellow down very carefully try to keep the edges of my line super crisp that like crispness between each of the lines is really what helps the effect so I'm trying to make sure I don't muddy it up too much okay 
drag it up through the tail here. We have a lot of green going on at the very edge of this tail, but I'm just gonna leave it as my yellow for now, and I'll add that green in a second. And then if I come down here to my fin, I'll push it up a little bit so you guys can see a little bit better, right? This area right here on the fin is almost completely green right there, and the yellows don't get in until right about here at the edge. So I'm just gonna start at that edge putting my yellow in. I think the fins on these images are probably the most complicated part just of how wavy they are. Which is why for your guys' sake I'm not trying to like get really into this right now. Just trying to hint at these little details. Okay, and I'm gonna add, I'm gonna actually start my green glaze. I'm gonna wipe off my brush a little bit. I'm not worried about completely cleaning it because there's a lot of mixing between yellow and green in this. I'm gonna get my oil and I'm gonna start with my green so I can start hitting it in those areas where the yellow is overlapping. Okay. Add a little bit more. And this is my, this is abstinence green that I picked out here. I think it is actually a part of the intense lines, but it's a really beautiful color. So I'm just gonna start hinting right at here at the top of the fin. I want you guys to know that it took me a really long time to figure out which paints and which colors I was going to use for this. I did try with acrylics, but they just dried so fast that it got really frustrating to get all those little details in. And it got really complicated because I couldn't do the grisaille painting just trying to get all those really complex colors down and understand what was going on without breaking it up into simple forms. Which is really what I'm trying to do for you guys here is just trying to simplify everything like a really complicated looking image. I hint a little bit of green down here. And then we have a lot more green up in the top of this fin. So I'm gonna put a decent amount, I'm gonna get a little more pigment, and a decent amount right up here. I'm trying to hold my arm really steady right now because <laughs> I can't lean over the camera to try and get this, which is what I would normally do if I was painting alone. So I gotta make sure that my brush hand isn't too shaky. There's a decent amount of green right here that I'm gonna add into this. Okay, just hit a little, hint in a little different areas that I see the green. It's even like a tiny bit right here. And I'm even gonna come back and drag the brush just a little bit more into this area here. So all you gotta do really is just work it color by color wherever you see it and then add back, you know, you find a place where it's like, oh, I should have put that color there. You can come back and add it back in with your glazes. There's even this really intense green that comes right in the eye here. So I'm gonna try to get a lot more pigment in my glaze. And just very carefully try to tap it in right there. The wonderful thing about the Grizz Eye painting too is that if you get your va values correct from your black and white painting, you don't have to worry about shifts in values too much while you're painting this. All you gotta worry about is where your colors are gonna go, which is why it's a wonderful medium for doing this kind of effect. You're doing something like super complicated, so adding a little bit more of my hints of green. Probably gonna come back to my yellow in just a second. It's a little bit more green just right here. I might even just start dragging it through my fin area. These fins on this fish are absolutely beautiful. I want to let you guys know I was messing around in Photoshop earlier today with this image and I turned the the saturation on this image was what it was originally. You know, I didn't edit the saturation at all, but I went in today just to bump it up just to see what would happen. And it looked absolutely insane. If you're messing around in Photoshop and you want to do that, it looks crazy because all the white different disappeared and it was just different lines of colors kind of going through the entire thing. It looked <laughs> really trippy <laughs> and it would be even more of a nightmare to paint somehow <laughs> than just this because these little like you get little hints of like oh there's a line of yellow right here or there's a line of like magenta right there right just in these mouth areas they really popped out because they're super subtle right now 
but they became really obvious and really intense. And that was kind of fun to play around with. I was merely like, Emmy, come look at this. <laughs> it looks crazy. See the stripy fish. Yes. Ferdinand's a, a fish of color here. Um, he's very colorful and he loves color. He's not like me who just wears black in a, <laughs> a very neutral apron here. Uh, by the way, if you get oil paints in your clothes, it will not really come out. It's really hard to get out. So do wear an apron if you're doing oil painting. I, you guys saw how messy of a painter I was last show. Uh, so be careful <laughs> if you're like me at all. Okay, I'm gonna come back to my yellow here. And keep in mind, whenever you're doing oil painting, if you're new to oil painting, these oils are gonna stay wet for a very long time. Like I left my palette out uh, for a few days and it stayed wet where I could keep coming back and working on it. You just gotta keep in mind, like once your painting gets touch, touch dry, you gotta think about fat over lean a little bit more if you're not doing like an alla prima painting. So I'm gonna start hinting a little bit more. There's a little bit, the mouth area is really where it starts getting crazy. So I'm just gonna try to find different areas where I see this yellow popping through and I'm gonna try to find the line of where that separation is. And if I don't figure out where it goes, that's okay. You know, just hint at where you want your yellow to be. Like there's a ton of yellow popping up in the top of his head right here where he's got all these little bumps, little bumpy goldfish. There's a lot of color separation. Then a little bit more hinted down here where he kind of had, if you look at the reference image that um, I left for you guys in the chat, he had kind of a darker area of orange around his mouth. And that's what these strange patternings down here are. It's kind of like that color separation of that really dark orange area. I had a little bit, I didn't clean my brush quite well enough, so I still have a lot of green in it. I'm gonna try to wipe it off a little bit more so I can add a little bit more of that yellow. If I come over here, I'm gonna try to trace. You can see on this image very clearly right here where all of your colors are kind of breaking apart in different shapes. So my yellow starts, instead of starting right next to where the red starts here, it starts just a little bit downwards of it. A little bit like this yellow is a little bit to the side of the red. This yellow is also a little bit to the side of the red. So it doesn't start exactly where the red does, but starts a little bit behind it. I'm just going to try to stripe that color in. Okay, it's already starting to look pretty crazy. <laughs> I have a lot of yellow too within his fins. So I'm just gonna do the same thing as before where I'm not gonna pay, you like you can pay super close attention to where every color goes within this fin and paint it out, but I'm just gonna take this color and I'm just gonna hint at it every once in a while, particularly where near where my greens are, right? If I wanna take my green there and I wanna continue it with yellow, since the yellow and the greens in this image are really closely related, it's gonna look a lot more realistic if I keep in mind like, oh, yellows are appearing next to greens a lot. So I'm gonna put my yellows in my fins right next to my greens. Cause they're kind of transitioning in and out of each other. And I have a really strong line of yellow right underneath this red here. And kind of a line right here, I think. So I'm gonna hint that up this way to try and emphasize that. I hope you guys aren't being too stressed out about all of the different colors and everything going around here. I wanted it to just be like a little bit relaxing where we can just like watch and see it come together and all of its craziness instead of like, how are they doing that? Uh, you know? It's so cool. <laughs> I still you can't. you down by color, it really definitely helps it all kind of come together. Yeah. Everyone, as soon as you start laying down the yellow, everyone was like, oh, that looks so cool. Yeah. Like, it looked amazing before, but. <laughs> The yellow's making it pop. Yeah, I still can't believe those 3D glasses work. That is so cool. I have a lot of hint of yellow right above this area of my fin right here. Okay. I think once I put yellow right up here, I'm actually gonna try to switch colors again. I think I'm gonna go with my dark blue since you guys really did not want the pink. I mean, I don't think we're opposed to the pink. Not opposed. No. I get not opposed to the pink, but it wasn't it wasn't what you guys were most excited about, and that's okay. 
I have a friend who I love very much and she is absolutely obsessed with pink. All of her stuff is a very specific shade of pink. Um, and her apartment is decorated absolutely. It's a very lovely apartment that she's decorated very specifically with all these different colors of this, all these different things of the same shade of pink and it's pretty wonderful. So I'm sorry to all you pink lovers out there. You were voted out. <laughs> okay. So I've hinted at that. I'm gonna wipe my brush off here. Actually, I'm gonna switch it around in the brush cleaner since I'm going to a drastically different color. I don't want my blues coming out greenish. So I'm gonna wipe that off. And I'm gonna switch to my Cyan Thalo is the name of this color right here. I almost called it Ultramarine. It does look like an Ultramarine. I'm gonna water that down there. And the thing is like this, color, it's very similar to the yellow in that when I had this as a black and white image, I couldn't see like this area down here at the edge of the fin. There's a little bit of this dark, oh, there's a lot of glare on that. You guys can see a little bit, about, a little bit of this dark blue right on the edge there beyond where this greenish cyan ends. And like when this is just breakdown in values, you can't see it. But when you put it into a painting like this, it, that very subtle hint of color there really helps make the effect. So I'm just going to start putting in this color right on my edges here. Be very careful to drag that down. And I'll probably, I don't think I'm gonna have time for it, but if I continued work on this after the show, which I'm not, I'm gonna go home, but if I did, <laughs> I would be conscious of like, there's a little bit of a gradient effect happening right here on the edge of my colors where you're coming up more into a lighter part of the fish's body, like here and here. And while I'm glazing this color down just to get an idea of where all of the colors are, when I'm working wet and wet, I might come back with a little bit more of that blue, try to get the color as intense as possible. Actually, I'll even do it right here. So I'm gonna get more of this cyan phthalo, try to get it almost like it's straight out of the tube with just a little bit of oil in it. I'm gonna go on top of my glaze right there, right there on the body. So I don't know if you guys can see it very well, but that area of the body right there is gonna be a lot more intense than the rest of it, which is gonna help mimic that like gradient effect of the curve of the body. I think you guys can actually see it a little bit better on this one here. I might've even added a little bit of white into it just so the color would pop, but you can see that curving downwards. It's a really nice, very like simple effect that like really makes the painting. So I'm gonna add a little bit there and then I'm gonna come back down here and start adding in my cyan thalo. And even though this is a cyan thalo, I'm really using this as the blue in my image, what I referred to earlier as my blue. And my viridian is the cyan, you know, like it can get pretty complicated, but like I said previously, if you're really hung up on what colors to use, because the colors in this image are very important, just keep in mind that they don't have to be perfect for the effect to work. And you don't have to use every single color that I'm using for the effect to work. You can simplify it down to just two of them, and it's still gonna give you that 3D effect. Okay. Just gonna hint at it a little bit there. Gonna make sure I'm getting a little bit more linseed oil. And I have this darker area with a fin right there where I'm gonna start adding it back in too. You guys can see here, I very quickly glazed this Viridian on the edge of that, but it's not quite as intense as I want. And I might go back in later with a little less linseed oil and a little more paint while it's still wet and mix it in there so it gets a little more intense. But I'm just gonna go over this blacker area of the edge of the fin with my Cyan Thalo. And we're getting close on time here. So if you guys have any questions, please let me know. But I might try to throw in just a little bit of pink here, just so you guys can see it with like all of the different colors that could potentially be in this painting. But I'm just gonna hint at my, quickly put in this color and some of the other edges here. Hint at it right there a little bit. I think I even, I even wanna bring it up into this part where you can see this area of my painting gets a little more complicated right here where I kind of have a more magenta tone that breaks right there. Um, but I'm gonna drag this paint down 
and then add that magenta in, or in my case, pink, so that they kind of mix, the glazes kind of mix with each other a little bit since it's not quite a true magenta right there since they're overlapping so much. I'm gonna wipe that off though. I'm gonna get more of my linseed oil right here. You can see how blue that is, so I'm gonna wash it off because <laughs> I don't want my linseed oil to be that blue with my pink. Wash it off in my brush cleaner. And then get a little more of my linseed oil to put down there. It's a lot cleaner now, so. Can add a little bit of that intense pink in. Okay. And then I just wanna dab at it right there where they're kind of overlapping. So I just get a tiny little hint of it, which I'm not even sure if you guys can see particularly well. But it's like, it's, it's all in the details, right? It's all in the tiny little details. And I also have a little bit of pink right here. Whoop. See, that came out super blue since I just put it into my wet blue glaze. But that's a-okay, because I'm just going to take my rag and wipe it off. Okay. Then I'm going to put up... Whoops. I did not secure that lid... <laughs> secure that lid correctly. This is... Mott cannot talk today. <laughs> Pick up a little more of my pink here and just start layering it in, in some different areas. And I, I forgot to go over the eye with my blue. I'm going to do that real quick. Forget the pink. <laughs> <laughs> right, I told you guys I wanted to show you how cool the eye was and then I completely forgot about it. It's just a lot going on. There's a lot going on in this painting. Okay. Okay. I'm putting, going back to my cyan thalo here, and I'm going to put a little bit more of that into my eye. Not my eye, but the fish's eye. Don't put your paints into your own eye, please. Uh, just gonna glaze it very carefully. You gotta remember that this eye is essentially just different circles overlapping each other. So there's a little bit of kind of a pinkish magenta color that comes down into here. So I'm gonna hit that in just a second. And even like, I could continue it up along this edge right here, but it actually looks a lot more purpley right there where a lot of that magenta and blue are overlapping. Or I should say, I think it's that's the red and the blue overlapping. So maybe I'll take a little bit of my pink here and I'm okay if it mixes with the blue because there's so much mixing going on in that area. Make sure I get a little bit more linseed oil in that. And I'm just gonna glaze right on top here where the edge of the eye is. See, that picked up a lot of blue right there. That really is like the tricky thing about glazing when you're doing so many different colors like this right on top of each other is just making sure you don't pick up too much of your other colors when you're laying them down. So I'm gonna get a little bit more of my pure pink here try and emphasize right here at the bottom of the eye. Okay. So last call for any questions. If you guys have any questions, I'm going to wrap it up here this shortly. This would work with water-soluble oils, right? Yes, it would work with water-soluble oils. The effect is essentially the same. I mean, it's similar to like how it would work for watercolors where you're just watering it down and glazing it. Okay, I'm just gonna put a little bit more of my pink right there at the very edge of my fins. They're my fins. <laughs> I keep saying mine as if like I'm the one with the fins, but you guys know what I mean. <laughs> okay, and then I'm just gonna put the tiniest pink up there. And then let's see here. I think that's as far as I'll go with this painting. It's already starting to get really complex, but you guys can see too how far it got within just an hour. And if we can go back to the overhead, we can do a little comparison here between the one I did before and the one I'm working on now. You get a lot of the glare there for the light, but you guys can see how quickly this can start coming together to get this wonderful, wonderful effect. So <laughs> thank you guys so much for coming tonight. 
Like I said at the beginning of this class, if you guys want to get any of the products that were shown tonight, make sure to check out our teacher's cart on jerrysautorama.com. You guys can be able to do this yourself if you'd like. Next class is gonna be really exciting. We're having a vendor show here with Jimmy Lensley, who is a wonderful, wonderful presenter. He is gonna be presenting on painting on a budget with Liquitech Basics um, fluid acrylics. That's what we're gonna be talking about. And I'm very excited to have him here. Um, if you guys want to join our Facebook group, please do. There's so many wonderful artists there that are posting art all the time. Uh, any level of artist is accepted. You know, you could be a very beginner and join the group and see what other people are doing. If you guys like this effect, you want to do it, please put it in that Facebook Live um, group chat there so that we can see what it looks like. I'd love to be able to see your art if you're able to do this effect. But make sure you answer the security code. There's one question on the security code. If you don't answer it, we're not going to let you in. You're a robot. You will not be let in. You're not a robot, but you would be deemed a robot if you didn't answer the security code. And yeah, uh, that was this show. Thank you guys so much for having me, and bye-bye. <laughs>